So I, I'm very pleased to introduce. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Capasso. Uh, Dr. Capasso has a special place in my career. He was the one who recruited me from Princeton to Bell Labs. Remember that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Capasso is, is currently at Harvard. Uh, he's the Robert Wallace Professor of Applied Physics. Uh, he joined Harvard in 2003 after a uh, long and illustrious career at Bell Laboratories where he became a Bell Labs fellow and um, most notably is the uh, inventor of the quantum cascade laser which has many applications uh, in the infrared and um, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, uh, a fellow of, of all the uh, various organizations and seems to have won just about every prize. So, uh, very distinguished uh, speaker today. Very pleased to have him. He's going to be speaking about sub-wavelength or nanoscale photonics, uh, and in particular, going to show some very nice results in the Casimir force. So, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. So, we have witnessed in the last, uh, I would say, 10 years, there is a revolution in actual optics. Even though, you know, someone, when I gave a similar uh, talk about uh, last year, at the end there was a question, you know, what's, what's actually new in what you've done? Everything is in Maxwell's uh, equations, absolutely right. That's both a trivial and a profound statement because Richard Feynman, if you read the lectures in physics, said, you know, we have not found yet a method at least an intuitive method, a systematic method to dig out all, all the wonderful physics and the application that are buried inside one a, uh, equation, such as Maxwell's a, uh, equation. So basically all what I say today is basically contained into, into Maxwell's a, uh, equations, except there is the quantum side, you know, the, these uh, quantum electrodynamical forces, which is kind of more, uh, more uh, subtle. So the revolution that has occurred in, in optics in the last 10 years, if we are actually realizing we are doing a lot of exciting things beyond the uh, diffraction limit. Basically, we can uh, uh, make uh, very tiny light spots well actually below the, the uh, uh, wavelength. So we can achieve so-called super uh, uh, focusing we can invent design materials called meta uh, materials where they can have negative refractive index. Therefore, that opens up an entirely uh, new set of uh, application from cloaking and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. We can control essentially by controlling the boundary condition of the electromagnetic field. That's of the main theme. We can engineer the near field uh, the far field of actually light sources, and we can actually engineer forces at actual nanoscale distances. You might think, what's the application there? Well, one application that I'm very interested in is it, is it possible through these techniques of sub-wavelengths for uh, tonics to reduce uh, static friction to a minimum level? That's a very, in, very engineering problem, yet it is uh, kind of fundamental. So um, these are the contributors, you know, without the students and postdoc, I simply wouldn't be able to do anything or close to uh, nothing. So we need to give uh, credit uh, first to them. And then I had a wonderful set of uh, collaborators from different universities, which you see here, particularly I have a great uh, collaboration with George Whiteside, world, world, world renowned, uh, renowned chemist, uh, Rice University and uh, uh, companies, we make a point of collaborating with uh, uh, companies and, uh, and so forth. And so uh, the theme of this lecture is the manipulation of electromagnetic fields at sub-wavelength uh, scales. And I'm going to uh, show you various ways of doing it. Rather than giving you general principles from which I tend to be skeptical from a philosophical point of view, I'm interested in solving problems. So I'll give you kind of a set of interesting problems and how we actually solve them. For example, how we can use metallic nanoparticles uh, to uh, design the near field, okay, the electromagnetic near field, how this become the building blocks for novel optical ma uh, material. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about optical antennas. If we make nanoparticles that are like nanorods, like rectangles like this, uh, we can, uh, 
combine them with light sources to do something very, very interesting. I'm going to be talking about novel approaches to collimator lenses, polarizers. And the last part is electromagnetic forces at the nanoscale. These are both classical forces. These are not the traditional re, uh, radiation pressure forces. You cannot think of this force in terms of a momentum transfer from light to uh, material. That's a classical re, uh, radiation pressure force. These are of the different uh, uh, nature. The most exotics are the quantum forces that, arouse, uh, that arise out of the zero point energy, both of vacuum and of uh, uh, materials. Now, technology is actually very important. I see a big future in nanophotonics in general, in nanoscale, in, in nanotechnology for soft lithography techniques, not as a way to oppose hard lithography because that would be, in any case, a stupid way to think about it, but there are complementary areas. There are, for example, if I want to pattern, if I want to make a, make a large-scale nanoscale large nanoscale structure over a large substrate, which is made of unconventional ma uh, material. Moreover, it's non-planar, a curved surface. You, you would agree with me, you cannot have to agree with me, that you can't use standard lithographic techniques. So how are you going to do it? That's where soft lithography comes in. I have a pretty large program with George Whiteside. That would need a separate lecture, and probably George would be the best person to actually give it. But it's an underlying theme. As much as we can, we're going to be using these techniques. This is just thing where we're going to talk a lot about plasmon. So many of you know that in a metal, you can have collective excitation of uh, charge oscillation. Basically, what happens is that the electrons under influence of an, uh, of an electromagnetic field can oscillate back and forth. And these oscillations are called plasma, plasmons. And uh, you see the formula there for the plasma frequency. Typically for metal, it is in the, in the, in the, in the ultraviolet. It's very interesting when you, when you study these uh, collective excitation of uh, a, uh, electrons oscillation in a, in a small scale uh, particle. Okay, then what you, if you look at scattered light, from such a particle, this could be a nanoscale particle, silver, gold, and so forth, you will see that there is a resonant behavior. At uh, some wavelengths, you, you get a peak in the actual scattering uh, spectrum, and the point of the position of this wavelength depends both on the nature of uh, the metal on, uh, and on the actual size. Okay. And this is a technique, by the way, that the old masters that made the famous Gothic uh, cathedral, you know, they made glass, you know, the stained glass, you know, with all those beautiful colors is basically plasmonic type of a effect. You have metallic nanoparticles embedded in this glass that give all these beautiful colors. Finally, there is another geometry that plasmon, if you have uh, now a surface, an interface between a metal and a uh, dielectric, what you can do is you, you can actually, in fact, in this case, you solve Maxwell's uh, equation, you find that there are interface waves. Uh, interface because the maximum in uh, intensity is right at the interface between the, uh, between the uh, metal and the uh, dielectric here. And these are so-called polariton waves. It's a, it's a it's an electromagnetic wave that propagates along the interface coupled to, these, to a charge density wave. So you have a, a surface wave of a charge that propagates jointly with, uh, with, uh, with an electromagnetic field, and it's called a surface plasma. So this is sort of the basics, only the things you need to know uh, to understand uh, the rest. Uh, and in fact, you know, this is how a surface uh, now, surface plasma is a very interesting uh, uh, object. Uh, the the uh, dispersion omega versus the parallel k, you see, it's not a straight line. It moves rapidly over. And uh, if uh, this frequency, this is interesting properties. I'll show you one of the fascinating things here. Consider this frequency might be in uh, the actual visible, okay? 
Now, if you look, is what is the corresponding wavelength inside the material? The corresponding wavelength is 2 pi, what? It is 2 pi d d divided by the wave vector, right? Which is the wave vector parallel to the actual surface. If you put in numbers for visible light, this corresponds to wavelengths inside the uh, uh, material that are at least in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the ultraviolet, and if you can go at higher frequency, they, they become X-ray wavelengths. So this is the key, you see. Using optical frequencies, we can obtain, we, we, we can access very small spatial scale inside the uh, uh, material. Why is that physically? Because the dispersion bends over. Essentially what happens, this is a case of slow light. You see the group velocity is that slope, that becomes quite small, the group velocity. So you have effective large refractive index and it is basically because of the effective large refractive index that the effective wavelengths of this visible light inside the interface between these two uh, uh, materials can be as short as the X-ray scale. So that's why plasmonics can be a bridge between, if you like, photonics and uh, uh, electronics. It goes to very simple physical consideration. So now, if we make a, a metallic particle and make it more complex, you see, now we take a dielectric core, like here, and a metallic shell, then this uh, famous group at Rice University, now Homi Halas and Peter Nord Nordlander have shown, you can tailor now uh, the plasma resonance over a much greater range. So if I had a gold nanoparticle, basically there is not a lot of tailoring that I, that I can do. The peak will be in the red, near, uh, near red wavelength. So if you change the diameter, you change a bit the resonance condition, but that's it. If you now have a combination of a dielectric and a metal, and you have two parameters, the two radii of the inner sphere and the outer sphere, then you see you can actually tailor you can tailor the resonance position from, you know, the uh, UV basically up to the mid-infrared. And this is so you have a greater tailor, tailorability. Now, my students and myself have started to think about another approach now. What if we can put together, you know, these core uh, particles, what uh, in these uh, nanoparticles, what uh, interesting behavior can we actually get? Now here I don't want to confuse you, but this gold is that complex particle I showed before. So that gold inside means I have an internal di dielectric core, silica, surrounded by a gold shell. That's the inside. So now we want to make cluster of these, of these particles here, which and we put them to, uh, to, uh, together. This is done in a chemical solution, in a wet solution, which has a polymer, which is embedded in it, okay? And essentially, the polymer functionalizes, you functionalizes these, uh, these nanoparticles. Think of it of hairs sticking out here, right? And essentially, what, what happens at the end of, uh, of uh, the process is that uh, uh, these are the actual hairs. This is actually created by the polymer itself. So you put these clust, these uh, core shell particles that I showed before, you put them in a solution, okay, and then you kind of let it dry. And as a result, at the end, what you get uh, uh, clusters of uh, particles with nanometric separation. Those are few nanometer, okay, essentially uh, these polymer uh, links. And now, you, this is a synthetic chemistry method. Of course, I'm not a chemist. You can easily f kind of figure that out. Fortunately, we collaborated with a group of leading chemistry at uh, Rice who taught my students the way on how to do this. So now you're interested. If we try to model this, this uh, uh, particle cluster, what is it? I can think of it as a series of, in, of, of inductors and uh, capacitor where I can get a looping current. So this must have a magnetic activity, right? So we, based on this, qualitatively, you, you can predict that if you do light scattering from such a particle, you will not only see the dipole scattering coming from, from these uh, particles due to charge oscillation,
but you will also see the magnetic dipole scattering due to, if you like, to physically to currents that can, that can actually can, uh, can loop around. So this is what my students predicted, and in fact, uh, this work came out in science last year, and we think these clusters can basically be the building block of a new class of metamaterial with very interesting type of application. These are the simplest uh, type of examples. And in fact, you know, I should have shown this, uh, right? This is a nanoshell uh, uh, synthesis, okay? You do the, f the functionalization with an actual polymer. So you have these, uh, these uh, hairs that stick out. Then you actually dry it. When you dry it, you have these capillary forces. The capillary forces bring together uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, individual core shell particles. And at the, and at the end, by Van der Waals forces, they uh, cluster uh, together. You can do, you see the diameter, inner diameter is uh, typically 125 nanometer. This is the one here and the outer shell is 30, 40 nanometer, you need an, an, an hydrophobic substrate, so you, you don't want to have wetting. Wetting kills it, doesn't work. You wanna, and uh, so the process works, uh, at least uh, to do in uh, the lab, to do some interesting uh, science. These are the, some of the TM uh, 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 pictures, and uh, the experiments are conceptually simple. You come in at, at a certain uh, angle of incidence, and then you look at the uh, light scattered spectrum because you don't want to be blind by this light source. That's why you look essentially vertically. And with a polarizer, actually, you can, uh, it's very helpful to understand actually what produces the different peaks. So this is a case of a single nano shell spectrum. That peak is a so called dipole peak, okay? So, um, I, don't, I can't give you all uh, the details because but when we started to look at the actual trimers, okay, uh, the, uh, the theory predicted that there should be a scattering peak at a wavelength of roughly near 1.4 micron due to this magnetic uh, uh, dipole scattering. And indeed, when we analyzed the, the uh, data, you know, with a proper, you have to use a polarizer in, uh, in a certain way, we found exactly the magnetic, uh, the magnetic dipole peak. So this was a warm-up exercise, although it took kind of two years, you know. I mean, this is a very long PhD thesis because the student had to learn the chemistry not from me, but by traveling to uh, Texas and so forth, and the experiment were run in different places. But at the end, largely thanks to his effort, Jonathan Fan, things worked out. This is a, a fantastic, I mean, actually, the day before Christmas, he calls me very late at night. He was down in uh, Texas to do some experiments, and he said, Federico, I found a heptamer. And I found a heptamer, you know. I says, wow, this is fascinating. I wonder how this uh, behaves. It turns out that the theory had done a year before by the group of Peter Nord, uh, Nord, uh, Nordlander in the actual same place. And you see, if you now look at the scattering uh, spectra, okay, uh, you, you, can, you can rotate the actual heptam and you will see at some point a very deep uh, minimum, okay? This is pretty impressive. There is kind of, we felt, this must be a kind of an interference type of effect. What the theory predictor is actually a, a minimum, okay? Now this, uh, uh, those of you, uh, some of you know, uh, have heard about a, a Fano resonance. This is a so-called Fano resonance is an actual minimum. The simplest way to try to understand it is basically the uh, following. If you do the theory and you look actually the, the modes of charge oscillation in this, uh, in this, uh, in this kind of uh, uh, heptamer, what you find is in this wavelength range, two dominant modes. The important thing, they overlap in frequency. They overlap in wavelength. One is a so-called, uh, is a mode which could be called a, sup, a, a super radiant mode, where see all the oscillation in the individual particles, they are in phase, okay? And, uh, and then there is another mode here, which is called a subradiant uh, mode, where they do not point in the actual same direction. And what happens basically is the following, that these two modes, 
they interfere. Okay, these are like two sources that interfere, and at some wavelengths, okay, there is maximum destructive inter, inter, interference, and you get a minimum, which is uh, uh, the theory gives it practically the identical place of the actual experiment. So uh, you can find, you know, this is obviously counterintuitive behavior. What might happen when you cluster this into a full-scale material? We don't know. But we believe this approach of clustering, the next thing we want to try to do is very hard to make a tetramer. You see, if you take a tetramer now, think of it uh, physically. If you have a tetramer now, from wherever you look it, you will see an actual trimer. So now you can get a magnetic dipole activity uh, we, we believe this is a basic, we, the, the calculation, we predicted it intuitively and the theorists did the calculation and find that these tetramers support, uh, support isotropic uh, 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 electric and uh, uh, magnetic dipoles. So the punchline, this could be a path to make these tetramers as, assembled together a new class of metamaterial uh, which will have probably very interesting property coming from the combination of these electric dipole activity and actually mag uh, magnetic dipole, and this is just that. It will probably need at least another PhD thesis, if not two. So you see, this is more in the area, if you like, of material science. There is not an obvious application. The next one actually is the work that I started to do as soon as I arrived at Harvard and I got interested in this stuff, you know. If we look at the property now, the optical people call this optical antenna. Now, antenna is a term used uh, by the two communities in somewhat different, sometimes similar ways, but take two, uh, two, two actually nanorod. If you have light that is polarized this way, right, you start to get charge oscillation, okay? And uh, there is an obvious, uh, res and you set up this plasma, plasma wave, right? And uh, at some wavelengths, you have a resonance. The first resonance is when, when? when half the wavelengths of this plasma oscillation corresponds to the actual length. That's the first. Uh, so what happens now? When you are at resonance, if you think a moment physically, you'll have maximum charge accumulation right at the end, when you are right at these edges here, at resonance. And so you can actually calculate these uh, calculation by finite difference uh, time uh, domain by F, uh, by F, DTD, take, uh, take uh, uh, NICS, but in, uh, at this uh, resonance condition, you have maximum field right here. Now, I want to stress this is a nano gap region, okay? This might be 20, 20 nanometer. The length of these antennas might be, you know, 150, okay? So what happens that when you are at resonance and you, you you take incident light on, you can make a, nano, a very intense nanoscale spot in the near field, right? This is not the far field. This is right where the source is. So now, obviously, if you, can, if you have a, an intense nano spot, you can do interesting things. So the first thing, this is one of the first things of my first student at Harvard, I said, you know, let's try to put this on the facet of a semiconductor laser. I told you, go get a commercial semiconductor laser, open it up, and try to build an antenna right on the facet. Okay, you see? Right on the facet. The field is polarized in this way in, uh, in uh, the plane, so that's what he did. This is a 0.8 micron off-the-shelf 30, 30, dollar $30 diode laser. It's a Sanyo laser in this case. And... Uh, and uh, what he did that using near field scanning optical microscope, he was able to actually image the spot right on the facet of uh, the lasing laser. So you see, we call this a plasmonic laser antenna. That is an actual near field scanning optical microscope uh, uh, picture. And uh, uh, the, the size is around 30 nanometer. The intensity we estimated to be, you know, in uh, hundreds of megawatts per square centimeter. This has to be operated in pulse mode. If you do it in continuous wave, the laser, everything melts, of course. This is extremely high intensity. This is a line scan. You see, if we take a line scan of that spot there in this direction, you see exactly what you expect, right? You see the maximum field of the antenna 
uh, right where the gap is, right here. That's the gap. And then at the end, of course, you're going to see the effect of these fields, these fringing fields here, which are these. So what could this be used? Optical storage. I mean, you know, you can put in the numbers, you could make a, a, ten, a five terabyte uh, optical disk. You know, you have a 20 nanometer spots, you can easily do a calculation. Actually, we realize after doing this work, there's a number of companies, big ones, that are working on very related uh, things, okay? And, uh, and, but I think uh, it's very interesting. We did this also in the actual mid-infrared. We made a nanospot at eight micron wavelength with our quantum cascade laser. You see, this is this picture here, right in the middle. Okay, right here. This is an eight micron, uh, this is a spot which is, uh, this gap is around 180 nanometers, so this is a, the image, if you like, a near field image of the light spot at eight micron wavelengths. So you can make in the near field a spot much less than the wavelengths, right? 80, 80 nanometer, the wavelength is, uh, is actually eight, uh, eight micron. You could use these nanospots for imaging, okay? If you could make what we are trying to work now is a broadband laser antenna, meaning to create light spots at different wavelengths, not just as a single wavelength. We think this could be used to do chemical imaging at the nanoscale. I mean, you want to image inside a cell, imaging inside a cell, you can't, uh, you can't really do it uh, optically. Well, you have to do it with sub-wavelength optics. Okay, so there's many interesting applications, some of which we are pursuing. Okay, now uh, this, I mean, get introduced to optical lithographic technique. Once I, uh, we did this work, I asked my new student, Jenny Smythe, is why don't you think of putting an array of antennas on the facet of a fiber. You know, a fiber, you can directly, wherever we want, you can uh, reach some remote places. So the idea is, was to, to uh, use this like as a, a Raman sensor, right? Uh, you have a light source coming in. Uh, you have this array of uh, antenna. You can make hotspots, right? I just showed you that this is a technique to create hotspot in well-controlled places. So now, when we have these intense fields, you can also in, uh, in, uh, in enhance the Raman effect. This is a very popular area. It's called surface enhanced Raman scattering. So that was the ultimate goal. So actually, she said, you know, this is actually quite easy to do. I mean, you guys have done this with a laser. I'm just going to fabricate this by focused ion beam. By the way, that pattern was created by focused ion beam. You put the gold on. You come with your gallium beam at 30 kV. You can actually scan. You can... Uh, draw things, so, we, so she started to do this, and then she showed me the fiber. The fiber looked red after doing this. Basically, the gallium atoms had changed the optical properties of, of the fiber. So here we were confronted with the first challenge. We cannot use conventional technique to pattern even the facet of an optical fiber. What are we gonna do? So she was very smart. She started to talk to the chemist, which I always say to the physicists, be smart, talk to the chemist, don't look down on them. We have a lot to learn. So within uh, two years of work, uh, in collaboration with George Whiteside's people, she was able to do actually something which I think is, is actually, I hope I brought in the slides if I did. Oh yes, I brought them in. I want to make sure. Okay, so basically what you start is you, 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 create, you create your pattern by hard lithographic technique on silicon, let's say. This is a, an example of a simple pattern. And then you want to find a technique to transfer it on, uh, on the facet of a fiber because you cannot write it directly. Writing it directly means damaging the fiber. So she figured out this way. You start with a PDMS. That's an elastomer. You, there, is a polymer, uh, there is a polymer layer that you cure with actual UV. And the polymer sticking out of the polymer chain, you have a sulfur atom. The sulfur atom, that group is called a thiol group. Chemists call it a thiol group. And, and it attaches very well to gold. This is incidentally one of the secrets of self-assembled monolayer, okay? In any way, so you press down this sandwich on this pattern and you lift it up. And then you simply stamp it down 
on any surface that you want, any up to a certain point, but I'll give you some pretty impressive example. So she called this technique decal transfer. Okay, and actually I think the chemists have taken notice. And so I tell you what she was able to do. In, in addition to patterning a whole fiber with this array, which is quite impressive in of itself, then I challenge her, says, do it on a natural curved surface. That's easy. That's not easy at all. That's easy. So she was able to do this, you see. She took a sphere, a microsphere of 200 micron in diameter, and she patterned a meta material. This is a so-called split ring resonator. These resonators have magnetic, uh, magnetic dipole activity also. And so she was able to transfer, you know, very complex pattern, you know, both look at those lines, 100 nanometer wide, 40 nanometer tall lines of gold, 100 micron long lines written and transferred as a continuous pattern, plus complex things. So I think this is fascinating. I mean, we want to explore whispering gallery resonator and to see if we add patterns like this, what will happen to them. But I, after this, I became an advocate of soft lithography and I'm converted to soft lithography. I think it's going to be very powerful, potentially revolutionary. I'm going to tell you now, I told you about near field application. I'm going to tell you about the far field. So the people that have touched the semiconductor laser, you know, when a semiconductor laser came out, some people at Bell Labs told me they was not considered a real laser up to a certain point because it's highly di, uh, di, divergent. So where is the spatial coherence? Yeah, good question. It's still a laser, but the divergence of a, a communication laser can easily be 20, 30 de 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 degrees in the actual vertical uh, direction and so forth. So uh, less in this direction. So the question is, is are there techniques to collimate the beam of a laser without using necessarily a, a separate uh, uh, lens, particularly in areas where lenses are very expensive, like in the mid-infrared, you know, 8 to 10 micron, it would be lovely to have a semiconductor laser which comes out with a highly collimated parallel beam without having to, having to use any external optics. Can it be done? We think, yes, so this is a general problem. I mean, uh, if we want to modify the wavefront, right, beam shaping of a laser, there is a whole list of things you can you want to do. High, high collimation, control of, of polarization. For example, can I create a, a, a semiconductor laser with circular polarization? That has many interesting applications. Can I make a super focused laser? It means that in the far field, listen to this, in the far field, I can create a sub-wavelength spot. According to John Pendry and the metamaterial people, that can be done. Actually, there is experimental evidence. Can we do beam steer in a single device? And these are more exotic uh, beams that you can think of. And our approach is to a pl uh, pattern plasmonic structures, these metallodielectric structure. I'm saying there is a thin dielectric layer between the facet of the laser and the metallic pattern. Otherwise, you short everything, right? If you put directly metal on the surface, you just create a short. So it's kind of obvious. So these are the uh, things. So we started a very brilliant student from Beijing University, Nan Fang Yu, who did really splendid work. But I need to give you now a one slide primer on what quantum cascade laser are, because this work was done primarily out of convenience. We make them in quantum cascade laser. So quantum cascade laser are commercially uh, 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 available now. They're unipolar lasers. You have no holes. Basically, light comes out simply from electrons that jump from one energy level to the next. And the key thing is that the wavelength is determined by the layer thickness. So by changing the layer thickness, you can change the wavelengths anywhere roughly between 3 micron and 300 micron wavelength. This is an example of a quantum cascade laser mounted, uh, which actually is sold now by company Pranalytica. If it says proprietor, it's not proprietor anymore. This was an early slide from a DARPA review, okay, but now I'm not violating anything, okay. This is a, there's a website and you can buy this a high power laser that emits a four and a half micron wavelengths, which is in the mid-infrared, and has a, a CW power of three watts, okay. So there are lots of applications. This is a field that is exploding, chemical sensing, lots of applications. So we have taken these laser 
they are highly, fairly divergent, typically 50 degrees in this direction, just because of the wavelengths to a wave guide ratio. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, you can, you can do it, you use lenses, of course. So, so this is how it looks like. You see the far field looks like this. The beam divergence is determined by the waveguide. This is the far field. So our first approach is this. How, now, how can I make a collimated beam in the vertical direction? I want to squeeze the beam from this way to this way here. So the idea, I use a, a concept of sub-wavelength photonics, you see. I put a sub-wavelength aperture right in front of the waveguide. You see that there, there is a waveguide here right in front. This is sub-wavelength. Sub-wavelength, so light is strongly diffracted. It comes out this way, it's diffracted strongly, couples into a propagating plasma wave, right? Now, I make this period here equal to, equal to a 2 pi phase shift. So each distance is 2 pi, 2 pi phase shift. Now, if I, look my, if I look in the normal direction, the far field will be the sum of the amplitudes from all, from all these, uh, these grooves here, right? And from this here, very simple. I get constructive in interference because they're all in phase. All, all these phase shifts are multiples of uh, 2 pi. Therefore, what happens? I get a beaming effect. I get a collimation effect. I get a squeezing of the beam out of this interference, and I get a maximum intensity. And in fact, these are the simulation, but I want to show you the data. You see, now if you put this pattern of grooves Right under the aperture, you see the beam is now squeezed from 60 degrees to 3 degrees vertically. So it's a knife edge beam, not terribly useful. So we said, how, how can we make it? The power, the power up, you can ask. Now you put a mask in front of the laser, like this. So this is kind of stupid. You say, where is the light going? I'm attenuating the light. No, because the losses at these wavelengths are very small. So uh, you have you have actually low optical losses. These plasmonic structures redistribute the energy and then essentially they re-radiated most of it in, in the actual far field. And the data show actually that the power level that you get before and after doing this trick is very comparable. The next thing is how do you want to make a fully collimated beam, right? A beam where you have two degrees this way and three degrees, two degrees, so highly collimated. You, so then the idea is you make a sub-wavelength aperture in, more, in, more, in both directions, okay? It's sub-wavelength in this direction here. It's sub-wavelength in here. The beam kind of a, tends to emerge with a lot of diffraction. You have a, now a radially propagating plasma wave, okay? So you want to match the wave fronts. You want to have a grating which is actually circular. Still it's designed with the same principle that the phase shifts are 2 pi between each groove. They are 2 pi here and here. So you get again this uh, interference effect and, and you can actually get nice collimation. This, this is a device, this is a commercial device from Hamamatsu made by MOCVD. They sell this stuff. This is what the output looks like before you do anything. And then what my students did, they put in a nice pattern, you see, by focused ion beam, this was done but we are trying by soft lithography, and you see how you dramatically change the far field. It now becomes highly collimated. You know, you get about a factor of 30 and 10 in one direction in the other. So this should convince you that you can do very effective manipulation of the actual far field, okay? The problem is it becomes even more serious at terahertz. You know, a quantum cascade laser, 100 micron wavelengths, the size of the active region is only 10 micron. This is a TM waveguide, by the way, so there is no cutoff problem. It propagates very nicely. The way in a terahertz laser the waveguide is, is actually is a metal semiconductor waveguide. The core is a semiconductor, the claddings are metal. The reason you can't use a dielectric waveguide is for practical reason. You would have to ask the grower to grow you a total of 30 microns of material, or actually more which is not very practical. Any crystal grower in this audience will immediately understand the significance of that. But if we make, we use only the active region, the laser here, we make, 
we use two, uh, two, uh, two, uh, two actually metals to confine the modes, and we can do that because these are TM modes, then we can have high confinement of light. You see, this is a sub-wavelength waveguide. So beautiful, high confinement, lots of advantages, unfortunately, very poor ray, uh, radiation output coupling. If you try to measure the far field, the divergence is almost 180 degrees. Yes. Well, it can vary between 120, 180. I mean, so we asked ourselves, can we do, in the terrace region, this could be very significant if we manage to collimate the beams. And uh, the detailed story is actually not uh, quite, uh, not exactly simple to, to summarize in a few slides. So I'll give you some bird's eye view here. The first we tried to, uh, we tried to do is says, let's put in a second order grating. Same principle as before. It does improve things. But you see, there is a large amount of background. You, you lose about uh, almost 40% of the light is not collimated. You can see here. So what is going on? That in the terahertz at 100 micron, the light, these, these waves, the electromagnetic waves are not well bound to the actual metal. If you want to have waves that are well bound, you have to go to sh to smaller, to actually higher frequencies. So in the terahertz, light does not, uh, does not, uh, uh, is not squeezed enough close to the metal grating. As a result, the effect of the grating is not complete. So we would, we are, is there a better way to actual pattern it? And there is a technique, uh, and the techniques is using these metamaterials. So what you do essentially with a metamaterial, you, you add a series of deep sub-wavelength grooves, okay? So effectively what you're doing, you, are, you create a very strong modulation of the refractive index at terahertz frequencies, okay? You see a much higher uh, refractive index and at the end of, this, of the plasma wave, so the net effect of putting this, uh, this uh, uh, pattern now is that the wave that travels along the surface is much more closely bound. As a result, it feels the effect of whatever pattern that you put in much, much, uh, uh, much, uh, much more. And the net effect actually was, so this is, if you like, is a new material. This is a metamaterial. That small periodicity is deep sub-wavelengths. And uh, uh, we, we looked at now what happens, you see, what happens, now you can ask yourself, how did we do this? Did we have to put a metal on? No, in this case, this is naturally not a metal. We've, we, set, we, we made the grooves directly on actually gallium arsenide. We didn't have to put any metal on, on this structure here. And the reason is, at terahertz frequency, wavelengths of 100 micron, gallium arsenide has a very, pretty large negative uh, value of the permittivity. So it's a good, relatively good metal at terahertz frequency. So you get these uh, plasma modes propagating in effectively what acts like a metal, the surface of gallium mass. So see, this is directly patterned, okay, with using focused ion beam. And what we saw, we show actually, we showed actually that you get uh, Somewhat surprisingly, a highly collimated beam in actual both directions, even though you get a horizontal uh, just goose in actually one direction. And if you look at the far field now, you can see it's, it's actually considerably tighter. You can look at the after picture. And we were able to increase the, the collected power significantly. Okay? So these are uh, more data on other structures and so forth. And... Uh, you can look, uh, you might ask the question now, why do we need an actual circular collimator where actually the circular goo? Well, what you can show actually that, that when these grooves are actually long enough, essentially at terrace frequency, they behave like good waveguides for light propagating this way along the surface. So at the end, you spread out so much the, uh, 
the, uh, the, uh, the uh, electromagnetic field sidewise, that you just need one dimensional goo basically to get full collimation in both the vertical and the actual, uh, in the actual, normal, the actual normal direction. So this is an example of a metamaterial of how you can manipulate the far field, in this case in the actual terrace region, to get a highly collimated beam. You go down in this case, you know, from 180 degrees basically to, to, 10, to 10 degrees di divergence, which is pretty significant. So I think this is a way to solve these problems for the terrace. Uh, and now I'm gonna switch. Do I have another, what, five minutes? 10 minutes, okay, good. This last part is about optical forces. This is actually, was work we started to do with a group of John Johnopoulos. This is a John Johnopoulos of uh, photonic uh, crystals and many other things at MIT. And you know, uh, until now there's been a lot of interest on uh, forces due to radiation pressure. Also you heard the f another important force is that due to, is a so-called gradient field force. Okay, it's the, when you have a, if you have like a, a, a focus beam, you can trap a nano, a dielectric nanoparticle around the uh, focal point, and that's the, the key thing for optical tweezers. So we knew about these forces, and we, we decided to explore the forces among waveguides, okay? Now this is an interesting story that we came up with something we think quite interesting, that definitely, you know, it was always there, but you know, it, probably took some motivation to try to dig it out. And the idea basically now to consider two waveguides, these are my two fingers here, light propagating both. Consider the fundamental mode of the waveguides. It's a Gaussian mode basically in both waveguides. And now you can ask yourself, is there gonna be any force between the waveguides as I make them closer? Obviously intuitions are uh, just if there is a force due to the evanescent light, the one in the air outside of the waveguide, it must be when I put the waveguide at sub-wavelength separation. And I'll tell you the results of uh, the calculation. This is basically the optical analog of uh, the hydrogen molecule. Yes, it sounds weird, but it is the optical analog. You'll, the language is the same. Well, it's uh, rigorously speaking, is the hydrogen molecule with one with one a, 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 one electron only. Okay, so you've taken out one of the electron. Then the math is essentially the same. So you see, when you have two waveguides like this, now if you combine them and the, the modes overlap, you can form two modes, right? One is a symmetric combination of the two modes, and the, the other one is the anti-symmetric combination. Right? You can ask yourself, what are the new modes of this coupled waveguide? Okay. Well, if I start to overlap the fundamental mode of the waveguide, I will, I will get a symmetric combination or the anti-symmetric. The anti-symmetric, the symmetric combination, when I overlap two Gaussians with the same sign, I get more intensity between the waveguides. This is pretty obvious. Where I overlap the anti-symmetric uh, I, I use the anti-symmetric combination, a Gaussian up and a Gaussian down, then uh, if I add them up, I will have at uh, the center between the waveguides less intensity. So the first one we call the bonding mode. You see, this is the same language as the two uh, hydrogen atoms. If I overlap the, the ground state of hydrogen, I can, I can have either the bonding state of the molecule of the anti, on the anti-bonding state. You see, and then what we did, we calculated the optical force in this situation. What turns out, the force uh, when, when for the symmetric mode, where you have more intensity between the waveguide, it is an attractive force, exactly the analog of what you have for, a, for a natural molecules for the bonding state. If you instead uh, ask what is the force Bit, uh, which is uh, due to the anti-symmetric uh, uh, combination with less intensity in the middle, that is actually a repulsive force, okay? We call this, so we call this optical bonding and anti-bonding. And, anti and actually there, is a, there are several ways to actually uh, uh, calculate it, and uh, the simplest way is to 
to take the uh, spatial derivative of the energy in the actual mode, and the, you can write the energy as the number of photons. And then you see that frequency there is uh, that frequency actually, what happens when you actually uh, get, uh, when you get the modes, when you get the waveguides to overlap, what happens? The frequency of this uh, bonding and anti-bonding mode changes with the actual coupling, and they actually split more, okay, as you actually get closer, okay? These modes, you form these two combinations. Essentially, it's the diagram that chemists form, right? You have the two atoms here, you get here, you get these super modes, and you get this. So the, so the physics is almost identical in terms of the math behind it and provides a very intuitive way to look at this. We were not fast enough to do these experiments and a group at Yale did a beautiful demonstration of this, the group of Tang, and now we are trying to sort of catch up by doing experiments between metal dielectric waveguide, where these are plasma waveguides, and so now when you start to get materials that are very close to each other, you have to contend with pure quantum mechanics. And this is about the famous Casimir force. So Casimir predicted this in 1948. He was a very famous physicist. And uh, he worked all his career at the Phillips Research Laboratory. But essentially he predicted if I have two metal plates, and he took the case of two ideal metal plates, take vacuum so you don't have to worry about complication of airs. These are not charged. Okay, they are uncharged. He said there is an electromagnetic force. And the force uh, that is given by this, you see, it's fundamental constants, H bar. This is separation of the plates. It goes to the fourth power. And then L square is the area of the plates. Okay? So how did he explain it? Actually, this is difficult to explain, right? I mean, you know, if you see this formula, you might say, what, what exactly is going on here? And... Uh, so actually, he wrote a wonderful biography. And he said when he, con he was doing the calculation, he said, literally, I didn't know what I was really doing. Well, I knew I was calculating something, but I didn't know exactly. I got a force, and I have no clue where this force uh, comes from. So he was in doubt. He was maybe doing some mathematical mistakes. So I said, I'm going to talk to Niels Bohr, who was his mentor in uh, Copenhagen. So he describes this uh, conversation with Bohr. It says, Bo spoke for about kind of one hour mumbling incomprehensible things, so I was very frustrated, but at the end he said, hmm, maybe what you are, maybe this is due to the effect of zero point energy. And said, this is lit up a bulb, and he said, um, he allowed him to give a physical interpretation of what he's calculating. So this interpretation comes strictly from the famous paper of Casimir, Basically what he said, this is a basically a, a radiation pressure effect due to quantum fluctuations. So these are complicated words for something actually quite simple to explain. So the way he explained it, or maybe we should say Bohr explained it, or put him in the right path is that between the metals you only have certain modes of the electromagnetic fields. Like given by the boundary condition, the fields must go to zero at, uh, at the plate, so you can only have an integer number of half wavelengths. These are standing wave modes, right? Outside, uh, outside the plates, you have all possible modes, right? This is free space. So now remember, quantum mechanics said that an electromagnetic wave is an harmonic oscillator, so for each uh, frequency, there is a zero point energy. An energy you can, even if you have no photon, you will still have an energy associated to that mode and a momentum. Uh, in the language of uh, quantum electrodynamics, in fact, this was Enrico Fermi's uh, contribution in quantum electrodynamics, he introduced the concept of virtual photons. This can be thought of virtual photons that are popping in and out from, uh, from uh, vacuum. So you see, outside you have a, gr a greater density of, of states than inside, right? Because inside you only have certain modes. So because outside you have a higher density of states than inside, if you like, these quantum fluctuations that hit from the outside uh, have a net pressure. You have a net force that pushes the plates together. So this is, uh, you know, at least an intuitive way to try to explain this otherwise somewhat uh, mysterious type of effect. 
It took a long time to verify it. Now I'll tell you something that is very interesting here. We actually did measurements of this in, uh, at Bell Labs. You know, we, very, we, we, use, we use a MEMS device. Essentially, we took a, a silicon plate. We metallized it so it could do this and this up and down. And then we put a metal sphere. As the metal sphere was approaching, what happened that because of this attractive force, there was a tiny tilt angle, you know, mic micro radiance that we measured by very sensitive techniques. So that was a direct measurement of the Casimir force, the attractive force. Now something more exotic is actually hidden in the physics, and this is due to the great Russians. Lifshitz was a collaborator of Landau. And you see now, when you try to calculate the force between two dielectrics, you know, not two metal, just to general, the hell breaks loose, literally. You see, Casimir did two ideal metals, infinite plasma frequency, conceptually easier. If you now put real uh, dielectrics, you see the, the mess. This is the Casimir energy, okay? At the end, uh, what comes in is the epsilon. You see, this is the imaginary part of the dielectric functions at all frequency. There is this integral at all frequencies. Of course, quantum fluctuation occur at all frequencies, so when you couple when you generate these, 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 these electromagnetic fields at all frequency, they can be absorbed by the material. They interact with the medium. It's called the fluctuation dissipation theorem, uh, from a, uh, if you like, from a more mathematical point of view. So uh, he, they calculated this force, and then they found after a horribly long calculation, 30 pages, I think very few people have read this paper. I was one of them, actually, because before putting student on this stuff, you better get a clue, you know, or what the heck is exactly going on. Okay, but in the metallic limit, it reduces exactly to the older thing. So, but there is a big surprise in this calculation. This calculation was further generalized by this other very famous trio of theorists, where they said, let's see if we, we put a fluid in between, what happens? And then this is what... Uh, a surprising result, okay? What they proposed is that uh, if, I, if I put a certain liquid in that satisfied a certain property, the properties are that that epsilon, I'm, I won't even attempt to explain this, but remember that in, when you're talking about quantum fluctuation, it's all broadband. That's the difficult part, you see? In, in optics, you can engineer optics by having narrow band, as narrow band as you want. That makes the calculation far more easily. You don't have this luxury when you do quantum fluctuation. Quantum fluctuation, by their very nature, are broadband. They go from the far infrared to the ultraviolet, okay, to X-rays. So everything has to be put in. And you need to know practically the properties of material, optical property at all frequencies. So now when you try to, when you say about dielectric functions, from the point of view of quantum flux uh, uh, tuition, you cannot just say the dielectric function at one particular frequency. You have to introduce this uh, uh, permittivity at uh, imaginary frequency, which is a way, is a mathematical way to say that, uh, the depths, that you have to factor in the whole dependence of frequency. I know it's complicated, but you have to bear with me because otherwise I have to spend two slides to explain what this mathematical object is. But basically, you have to bring home the fact this: I choose three materials such as some generalized permittivity is in a descending order. So the top is more dielectric than the bottom, than the fluid, and more dielectric than, uh, than the lower material, okay? Then was this false predicted that if you have this particularly ordering of the electric properties, the Casimir force changes sign, changes sign, okay? And so we were very puzzled, you know. So I, I managed two of these scientists are still alive, very active, Dialocinski and Pitaeski. And I contacted both of them and I kind of was kind of afraid, you know, says I told these great people, and basically I tell them, look, I have no clue. I don't understand what you've done. Can you explain it to me? And they were both very honest, said, well, we, we, we don't understand it either, really. You know, we did the theory, but physical understanding, you know, but we are out of, your, of our luck, you know, to give a simple explanation. So we were kind of uh, refreshed by that. 
and started calculating these forces. For example, if you take a gold, uh, uh, ethanol, and, uh, and uh, materials such as gold, uh, uh, ethanol, and silica, okay, you have uh, that the dielectric properties of one defined in that way are always greater than the middle, and the dielectric function of the middle is greater than that. So they said, well, maybe we can measure an, a repulsive force. You realize the uh, technological significance. If we have two surfaces in close proximity separated by liquid and have a repulsive force that compensates the weight, you can get into a situation of reduced static friction. In fact, we, we got a patent recently. We think there are some very interesting applications. So, I had a student put in, he's the hero of this. This is another thesis that lasted basically six years, you know, with a student for physics, measuring with an atomic force microscope. This is an atomic force microscope. You have a cantilever. We attach the metal. So the first, me and then the way, the way you can measure a force is as you get closer, you get a piezo column, you get the two closer, you reflect light from the top. As you reflect light from the top, as you get closer, you see if there is an attractive force, this, uh, this bends the cantilever and you can look at the changing position of the actual reflection. So you calibrate it so as to measure uh, this force. The first one was just gold, gold, and uh, ethanol. This is a purely uh, attractive force. When the materials are the same, the outer material, you always get an attraction. And you know, this took a long time to do right. The next was to look at uh, a combination which could give us maybe some luck to observe this repulsion. It was to look at gold, bromobenzene, and gold, and then substitute it with silica. The prediction is if you substitute gold with silica, the force becomes from attractive repulsive. And uh, that's what we got experimentally. You see, those are the, the raw data on the left. This is a deviation of the actual cantilever, okay? This, if you like, this going down represents the cantilever bending under the action of the attractive force on the gold sphere. Eventually, you go into, uh, into, uh, into contact. If you instead switch just the lower plate with another material, you get into a repulsive regime. And uh, if we... Uh, calibrate the system. I mean, again, this is work that lasted several years. We measured in one case an attractive force, gold and gold in bromobenzene, turning into repulsion when we substitute the lower gold with silica. These spheres, incidentally, are 50 micron uh, diameter, plastic covered with gold. The force is under, under in the pico-newton regime and so forth. Now, there is a we have an interpretation for this, and we struggle mightily because I don't like to work on something with some kind of physical understanding. So we really struggled a lot. At the end, we interfaced with the Russians, and they, they actually came to a similar conclusion that probably there is some mechanism of this sort. You see, you can ask yourself why certain combinations of dielectric function can produce, uh, uh, can produce an attraction as opposed to repair. Now, here I want to give you something as simple. Uh, if I have the polarizability, the dielectric function is proportional to the polarizability of the material. The polarizability says how, how much the molecules of the material of the atom polarize. So I can write the polarizability of 1, 2, and 3 as alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. So assume I have three molecules, you know, three materials made of molecules which have a which have a polarizability that goes in that, in that descending order. Then I know simply that the van der Waals forces, the molecular forces, go with the product of the actual polarizability. So you see, if I now have alpha 1, alpha 3, and alpha 2, 2 is, a, is essentially a fluid, okay? The forces will be ordered, will be forced to be ordered, meaning the force between 1 and 3 will be the larger of, the, of all the possible forces because alpha 1 is greater than alpha 3, greater than alpha 2. So this is individual and individual molecules level. So now, this is the next thing we did. Oh, but a material is made up of these molecules, atom, however you want to call them. So if we mix them together, what's actually going to happen? How, how are the forces going to go? 
Well, because the force between F1, between one and three, is the actual the strongest one, the liquid, essentially the physical picture we have will force itself in between the two solid material, and that will create like a hydrostatic type of effect. So that's, that's we think, is the reason why when we put in contact two solids with a fluid in between, which satisfy that ordering of the electric function, you get at the end what is a quantum mechanical repression. It turns out, actually, that one of the Russians did the theory after our experiment, redid the old theory, 30 years old, and found an interpretation which is very close to what we decided never to put in print because we weren't sure. Maybe we should have. This is the paper where, which published this effect. So I think this could be important for understanding friction and, uh, you know, at a basic level and maybe do some technology. So I'm near, near the end of the talk. Sorry, this last part I realize is quite uh, uh, difficult, you know, and particularly to, to grasp uh, physically. We are trying to do our best. <laughs> And again, the summary is I hope I've given you some example of how you manipulate the uh, electromagnetic field, the sub-wavelength scale, the applications to physics, chemistry, and other areas are pretty obvious. We started how we can make new kinds of clusters of nanoparticles that could become building blocks of new material. I showed you if we, if we make now antennas, which are an example of nanoparticles, we can engineer the near field and do uh, engineer light spots, there's interesting application. We can also engineer the far field, of course, of light sources. We can make collimators, polarizer. I just gave you a glimpse of what you can do with optomechanics, coupling optical to mechanical degrees of freedom. You can get very interesting classical forces. These are completely classical, this evanescent wave bonding and antibonding. You can get a attraction, a, a, a attractive and repulsive Casimir forces. And although did not spend a lot of time, there's, a, I think, the critical role that uh, technology is alternative to hard lithography will have in the future. Essentially, you know, chemistry getting closer to physics, uh, self-assembly, one of them, at soft lithography in particular. Thank you for your attention. Do we have any questions? Everything is clear. Yeah. <laughs> is there another microphone for back there? Yeah. So when you were talking, when you were talking about the uh, essentially the bonding and anti-bonding, is what's I was kind of confused on what's going on there. Is it because the size of the spot is so small that it's essentially wrapping an electron no, around the, it? No, no. The, the bonding and the anti-bonding was related to uh, the waveguides. So it's just the, uh, the simple problem of two, two dielectric waveguides. Think of two ridges of silica, right? And uh, just one, one, one at a time, you have light propagating, and then you put, you put uh, nearby another, another waveguide, and you can do an experiment. The experiment, you can generate the uh, symmetric combination is easy. You just send uh, uh, two beams in the two waveguides with zero phase shift. And then you progressively vary the phase shift between the two light beams. When you introduce a pi phase shift, now you are really overlapping, you know, uh, two modes with a, a pi difference in phase. And as a result of this, you form an, you form a, uh, you form an antibonding state where there is less intensity in the center than when you overlap the two modes with the same phase. And that gives rise to the fact that the force changes, uh, changes sign, actually. That's what I was uh, talking about. And it's exactly the analog. I mean, the mathematics is actually not surprising at the end, you know. Again, we, have, we had, after the fact, people telling us that it was obvious. Yes, it's obvious once you, feel, once you think about it. <laughs> I don't know if it's clear now, that's the physical situation, right? I, I have a question. Um, I, I've read several articles going back quite a few years on uh, whether optical antennas can be applied to solar energy uh, as a collection mechanism. Have you thought about that? Yeah, I mean, I, um, 
It's very interesting. I mean, I think so. I mean, there's several groups. Uh, uh, there's a group of Harriet Water. David Miller has looked at it from the detector point of view and others. I, I think it's all clever work. I mean, one reason that I'm skeptical is not about the quality of the work, but solar cells are so cost-driven at the end. To, the economics is so dominant. And I'm telling you, some of my students would like to get in the data. I says, that's one of the few areas that I'm skeptical because being clever, very clever, is just not enough. You can have the most brilliant thing, but if it's not, if it's not cost effective and you add in complications, this is it. So I must say, I remain deeply skeptical about it for purely economic reason, which is not my normal modes of thinking. But you know, this time I'm saying, you know, we better have an impact, right? Because if you can't, it's, it's never cheap enough in solar cells, right? So I mean, my, I think uh, the, all, all the stuff is right, what they've done. You know, they've, they've increased the collection efficiency. The science is very good. I just don't see a lot of potential because of the economic barrier, you know, right? Regarding the, uh, regarding the self-assembly for uh, the future of lithography, if you work with the self-assembly of small enough particles that begin to look more like individual molecules, does this mean electronics will come to resemble chemistry, essentially, and then maybe one day we see, make a computer chip in a test tube or something? Yeah, there is some practical limits on, on, the, on the scale of these uh, things. In reality, the smallest particle that I've worked on, I think, is you know, tens of nanometers. I really haven't really thought about it. I mean, I'll tell you something. That, that work is completely far, still very far from application is we have no controls on the yields. You know, we, you get mostly, the most commons are the, other than a single particle, are uh, the dimers. Sometimes we, we get trimers, then quadrimers, and lucky enough we get a more complex thing. Occasionally we get a, a tetrahedra also, so obviously that is not a practical path. So, uh, so, you know, we are doing it primarily just to understand uh, the science. I mean, uh, my postdoc, my former student is a postdoc in my group, is trying to use DNA self-assembly because he thinks he can control in a better way the, the, the gaps, even influence the yields, you know. But, uh, you know, I got into this kind of accidentally, you know, after working, I mean, again, I, I would have stayed away having essentially very little knowledge of chemists, but then we found the good collaborators. So I find in a university it's actually great. You know, you just find some great collaborators who know all the stuff that you, that you don't know, and good stuff comes out eventually. <laughs> uh, one last question. Yeah. Well, uh, just to extend what he said, uh, my dad is a protein chemist, and there are a number of creatures in nature that have self-assembling liquid crystal type structures where they can actually vary the composition composed of interlocking elements in a specific sequence from one end to another of a structure. Yeah. And uh, perhaps by making the nanoparticles in separate test tubes with different binders and then mixing them yes, up. Yes, it's probably true. Actually, this is in the area of so-called biomimetic materials. In fact, we have a professor at Harvard, Joanna Eisenberg, who's a world leader in biomimetics and she tries to learn from nature, uh, you know, techniques to assemble. So I think it's actually, it is possible to actually go, uh, go smaller. But in plasmonics, well, at the end, you know, you want to get a resonance at the wavelengths of interest. That's it. You're pretty much limited in the actual size, uh, right? I mean, if you'd go small enough, you, you just don't get, uh, you just don't get the resonance. Uh, uh, Right, you just don't get the problem. So in Pratt, I mean, for plasmonic, you are limited to that regime. But, but yeah, from a, um, I think from a point of view of fabrication, you definitely can go smaller. Well, it has to. I mean, right. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker.